Well, good morning. It's good to see you. Really happy to be able to be here today and uh, enjoy uh, some, some more study from, from God's Word. Uh, just a heads up, uh, this evening we will talk about everything you always wanted to know about 1 Samuel and Jesus, and we're afraid to ask, or something like that. So. <laughs> At any rate, I'm excited about, the, uh, uh, about a message of 1 Samuel from a messianic point of view uh, this, this evening. <clears throat> First uh, Peter chapter 5, you open your Bibles there, First Peter chapter 5, we're going to look this morning at the first four verses. One of the things that is, uh, uh, is tough about studying this particular text is that we have almost always studied it independently of the message of First Peter, right? <laughs> we said, well, we want to appoint elders, so... Let's study 1 Peter 5, 1 through 4, and we will learn about what we need to do. Actually, we usually don't do that. We just say, forget that. Let's just study 1 Timothy and Titus, and we got this. Uh, huge mistake, right? <laughs> not what we want to do. Anyway, this particular text is not just thrown in here, and that's what we need to start with. We need to start with saying and asking ourselves the question, why does Peter seemingly, suddenly, in the midst of preparing his audience for trials and for suffering, why does he suddenly go, oh, let me talk to you about elders? <laughs> uh, no, there's a connection here, and that's what we want to especially pay attention to. You will notice, uh, in fact, let's just read one through four, since I, I had Anand read for us Ezekiel instead. Let's read one through four. So I exhort the elders among you as fellow as a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ as well as a partaker in the glory that is going to be revealed. Shepherd the flock of God that is among you exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly as God would have you, not for shameful gain, but eagerly, not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. In the ESV, I do want you to notice first off the word so. So, I exhort the elders. If you're reading the American Standard Version or the New American Standard Version, you would see him beginning with the word therefore. Ah, that really highlights it better, doesn't it? So he comes to the end of chapter 4, and then he suddenly goes, therefore. Therefore what? Well, therefore, go back to verse 19. Let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to the faithful creator while doing good. There is a fiery trial coming back in chapter uh, 4 and verse 12. Don't be surprised when this fiery trial comes. So because this fiery trial comes, is coming, and is in the future here, therefore shepherds. I want shepherds to be prepared. And so a special note that he's giving, remember 1 Peter is written to many, many, many churches that are spread across the northern Asia Minor area. And so he's giving this, and there'll be elders in all these churches, and he says, I want the shepherds then to pay careful attention to what I'm about to tell you based on the fiery trials that are about to come. With that, we study this not just simply, well, what do we need in elders or shepherds? We study it from the point of view of trials and suffering that are common, obviously, and he's told us this throughout 1 Peter, they're common among Christians. In fact, it is to be expected. It is not to be a surprise when these things come upon us, and we've spent quite a while looking at that. Let's make a few initial observations here and just look at some, some key words and phrases that we see in this little section here so that we can become acquainted with the things that we need to talk about. Uh, first and foremost, notice there's a basis that Peter gives for his exhortation. And he gives three things about himself that is the basis for giving the shepherds this exhortation. The first is, he says, I'm a fellow elder with you. 
I'm a fellow elder uh, with you. As a fellow elder, I'm giving you this exhortation. That immediately, I believe, makes us think of what Jesus told Peter three times back in John chapter 21. Remember that? When Peter had denied the Lord three times and then Jesus uh, turns to him in this last uh, time before he was going to leave the earth and says, Peter, do you love me more than these? Um, I, I just, you know, uh, I, I, if I were uh, being a bit lighthearted with Jesus, uh, and uh, I'm not Peter, but I, if, I were, if I were just being, you know, I'm talking about later on, we get to heaven and, and uh, we're having a little discussion, I'd say, that's the meanest thing you ever said. Boy, that is a tough, you know, Peter's low as he can be. And he goes, you love me more than these? You had a big boast about it, <laughs> you know, how you of all of them were never going to fall. You know, it's just embedded in all that tough situation. And, and Peter humbly saying, Lord, you know I love you. Uh, and then again, he says three times, tend my sheep, feed my sheep, feed my sheep. Isn't that surprising? We, we uh, sometimes look for elders that... Uh, uh, never did anything wrong in their lives. <laughs> any, any shepherd here want to stand up and say, yeah, that's me. I never did anything wrong. Um, never made any major goofy things. Never, never really blew it. Uh, and yet, Peter did a major, major mess up here. And what did Jesus know about Peter? Now, some people would certainly have a major mess up and it would indicate itself as a weakness in their life repeated many times after and then we would be worried obviously but in this particular case jesus understands that peter has learned a valuable lesson it has taken away all the arrogance that peter ever thought of it has taken away everything that peter ever had that was jumping forward and saying hey you know let me uh, let's build three tents <laughs> you know, let's do this, let's do this. And, and uh, Lord, you're not going to suffer. And you have to see all these times in which Peter was jumping in and trying to be the great control guy. Uh, uh, all you Enneagram people, he was probably a one, right? He, he was just, he was going to do all that. Uh, but here Jesus recognizes that Peter has learned a major lesson, and Peter is going to use this experience to feed his sheep. You know, that's the kind of guy I want. When, when I have gone through my trials, you know who I seek out? You know who you seek out when you're going through your trials? Somebody who's been through something similar, don't you? Even if they failed, <laughs> even if they had a hard time, even if they messed up, where do I go when I want to learn about how to deal with a very, very serious trial? I go learn from Job, even though Job messed up. Because Job can tell me where he messed up. And when you come to me about trials I've been through, I can tell you where I messed up. And I can give you a warning. I can help you through it and show you how to do it better than I did. And so the, Jesus knows that about Peter. He recognizes that. And that's a beautiful thing to see that Jesus recognizes this, this, this great um, pattern of coming out like pure gold that trials can do for us. And that's how Peter started this letter, remember? In chapter 1, he says, these trials are going to make you come out like pure gold. Well, yes, then who do I want to seek when I'm looking for, and this is the reason the word elder is used in the three parts that he gives for those who will shepherd a flock. An elder is experienced, but not just experienced, but has learned from the experience. And they are the ones we want to sit down with and go, man, just tell me about it. My... Uh, First main, first main elder I, I worked under as a preacher, a man named Floyd Goff. His son uh, is still alive today in, uh, uh, in Mount Pleasant, uh, uh, Texas. A uh, good friend. And, uh, and Floyd was just amazing. I'd, I would, you know, as a 30-year-old kid, I'd go over and sit down in Floyd's house, and I'd go, Floyd, just talk. 
I mean, beautiful words of wisdom would just flow. I just just talk. <laughs> Lloyd had been a farmer in and uh, and he in Arkansas, and uh, and he had come out to California, and he delivered milk. He was just a down to earth, simple guy who could tell you everything about everything that had to do with anything in life. And he was honest and straightforward, and he was special. That's, 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 you know, you don't find those kinds of people very often, but his experience in life gave me so much that I lived on uh, all of my life and still do just remembering his words. And that, that's a beautiful thing when Peter can say, I am a fellow elder. I have been through, as you know, you can just hear them thinking, yeah, boy, he has been through it, hasn't he? He has really been there, and he has learned from it. And then he says also, a witness of the sufferings of Christ. Wow, how many people is a, are witnesses of the suffering of Christ that were actually followers of Jesus? And, and Peter says, yeah, I was there. I saw them beat him. I saw what they did to him. I saw all of those things. Yes, the implication you can read behind that is, yes, I failed, but I saw it, and I saw what he went through. And therefore, it was real to him, and he could prepare his mind better than anybody else to say, I need to prepare myself for that. Remember those last words in John 21 he said to Peter? The day's going to come where someone's going to bind you and take you where you do not want to go. <laughs> and Peter was still learning. I just think of him maybe as like a 30-year-old guy at the time or something. And he goes, well, what about John? <laughs> that was always a funny one to me too. Uh, Peter is great. We got we to have conversations with Peter. But he says, I witnessed that. I know what it is to get ready now, and I want to help you get ready too. Beautiful words. And then thirdly, he says, I'm a partaker in the glory that is going to be revealed. That's an interesting statement, isn't it? I'm a partaker in the glory, but it's a glory that has yet to be revealed. Well, how can you partake in a glory that has yet to be revealed? Well, because he's already mentioned that back in chapter 4, in verse 13, he says, Rejoice insofar as you share in Christ's sufferings, that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is re revealed. And you, if you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of glory and rest and gun of God rest upon you. He says, I'm a partaker of that glory. Why? Because I have been suffering and I am going through suffering. I'm a partaker with you. I'm a fellow partaker with you in suffering. I know what it's like and I experience it and therefore I know. I know that I'm a partaker of the glory that is to come. That's a neat thing to think about, isn't it? We should think about that when we go through times. We're a partaker of the glory that is yet to be revealed. And it's a really fun thing to just think about and a positive thing to think about in our lives when we're getting ready for this. So, uh, bottom line, I think one of the really important things to then get out of this is Peter is exhorting these elders for a main reason. He's exhorting them because they need to be prepared for trials to come, even though they are now in the midst of trials. So we know from the letter that they're in the midst of trials, but he wants to make sure they're strong for the trials that are to come. Not only that, it is extremely important that these shepherds be what they ought to be now in the midst of trials that aren't so hard so that people have confidence in them when they are in the fiery trials. Shepherds, just like everybody else, lay a groundwork. We all lay a groundwork of pocket change, if you will, with one another so that we can trust one another and build trust in one another. And shepherds, obviously, especially, have to have a period of time in which they're truly building trust so that when it really gets tough, we're able to sit back and go, we trust them. They've got this. And we are going to follow where they take us because they've been through these things before. You can see that in what Peter is saying. This is about preparation time for trials. And, and it, it is so very, very, very important that we have men as shepherds 
who are experienced so that we have that trust on those occasions, they are the ones that most need. I've, I've in my life seen, unfortunately, periods of time when elders uh, caved, when the pressure got really tough. They just simply caved, and it was devastating to see it happen. That, that's the worst thing. So the experience, the, the metal that it takes, the going through the trials, all of those things are critically important for the trust of the flock. And that's what Peter's basically doing here. You know, we can just read this like, here's what shepherds ought to do. But this is, that's not what he's doing. He's preparing them and saying, this is what the flock needs of you. This is what you need to be. This is important for us to be able to strive together properly. So it's beautiful words here that are, that are so important and encouraging. Uh, let's, let's also notice a key uh, phrase here. Shepherd the flock of God among you. And, and uh, uh, I, don't, I don't obviously know how much Peter, through inspiration, knew what was going to happen just really a, uh, not too many years after he died. But this particular little, little phrase was very, very quickly violated. By 150 A.D., by 150 A.D., uh, elders or shepherds were no longer overseeing the flock among them. They were taking control of large areas. They decided they needed to protect other churches from the rising Gnosticism that was taking place. And so big, big city churches, or big city uh, shepherds in big city churches, began to kind of annex small suburban churches in order to protect them and say, we're also overseeing your groups here. I mean, after all, you don't have men in your group to be shepherds like we're shepherds, and so let's protect you. And so they created this. And of course, uh, if you know anything about church history, you know how devastating that is. That little violation led to a pope 500 years later who ruled all churches. It led to, in 325 A.D., the uh, Constantine being able to gather 318 of the major bishops throughout the empire in order to set a standard of what everyone ought to believe. And now, what do you have? <laughs> you have a situation where the churches are following men instead of studying for themselves. And just you have this dictatorial type of thing that's endured even to this day. And the crazy thing is, if you think it hasn't happened among us, you haven't been very aware. Churches of Christ all over Nashville have practiced this openly and clearly. Large churches taking oversight of other churches that they have helped plant. I can show you the website if you doubt it help plant other churches and say, well, you know, since you're a new church, then we need to help and we need to oversee you. Uh, Peter says here, there's no authority for the next 1423. Paul said they appointed elders, plural, in every church, singular. It's a major, major violation, and it's ruinous, uh, as we saw in the growing of the Roman Catholic Church, but it's ruinous in any kind of organization. Just to, just to give you another illustration, discussion with a Jehovah's Witness a few years ago, and he says, you know, the difference between us and you is you guys don't know what you believe. You can go to a kingdom hall anywhere in the whole wide world, and we will all believe exactly the same thing. I said, yeah. And from our discussion, you already know that some of the things that have been universally accepted in your group because of the dictation of Brooklyn, New York, are wrong, and you know it. You've admitted it. It's not valuable to have a magazine, a group of men, a preacher, or whoever else to say, this is the rules. This is the belief. This is the faith. We come together seeking truth. We have not arrived. Don't pat ourselves on the back and say, yeah, we, we got there. 
No, we're seeking truth. And every generation has to do that. And, and to create an oversight from other than the local shepherds, who, by the way, do not even do that, <laughs> stand up and say, here's the belief. That's not the way that works. We study these things. So there's no, there's no authority for that, and yet it goes on and on and on. Goodness, back in the day, well, I can remember in my youth, where they, uh, white people didn't want black people worshiping in their church, and sometimes black people didn't want to worship in white people's church, so they would start a black church, and then the white church would oversee the black church. Yikes. Heaven help us. <laughs> This is such violations in many different ways, obviously there. Also, no over, oh, there's no authority for a church to decide we're going to do this massive evangelistic work that is beyond the monetary means that we have here. So what we're going to do is we're going to call all the churches and say, send us your money and we will oversee this massive evangelistic work in which we'll spread the gospel to the whole world. Sounds wonderful! Except you have no right to oversee the funds of another church. If you can oversee the funds of another church, you can oversee everything in another, another, in another church. You have no right. You oversee the flock among you. It is very, very pointed, very clear, very simple. Same thing. And there's no authority for a church to decide, you know, we want to sponsor a preacher, but we don't have enough money to send and support this preacher to do this work in wherever you want to send him. And therefore, we're going to invite other church churches to come and do this. And we're going to have a conversation with a guy when I was in Fayetteville, Arkansas, and he says, yeah, I'm seeking, uh, seeking uh, uh, a church to sponsor me while I go and preach the gospel in this foreign country. And I said, what do you mean sponsor? I knew what he meant, but I wanted him to hear it, I, hear it from him. Uh, what do you mean sponsor? Well, well, see, there'll be this church over here that will oversee me, but they will get funds from all kinds of churches so that they are, and then that makes me feel comfortable because I have oversight and because I don't have to worry about whether or not I'll lose support because they will sponsor me and you're going to get money from it. So you just established your own pope missionary society is what you did. Turn the church into that. And they are going to be the pope of your evangelistic work. It, it, it seems small. But it's exactly the same principle. You can't condemn one without condemning the other. It is illegal. <laughs> can't do it. And there's no authority also for the same thing with benevolent efforts. Oh, there was a big storm in India. It, there's a lot of Christians who have need. So we're going to establish ourselves as a sponsoring church, and we're going to invite all kinds of churches. You send us the money, and then we will take care of overseeing what's going over here using your money. No, I don't think you will. Because you need to take care of the flock among you and get your nose out of other people's business. That's just the way it is. And this is the kind of thing, again, that is widespread. Be warned. Be aware. This is not a minor issue. It ends up to be the greatest uh, error that was created in the second century. It started everything downhill. And it started just that little thing. We're going to defeat Gnosticism. Did they defeat it? Yeah. They crushed it and created a monster in so doing. Careful. God's way is the way. And it's just simple New Testament Christianity. That's what we have to worry about today. So those are just important things to understand here. And I would say furthermore, that there is an implied requirement here. There's an implied requirement that we are willing to submit ourselves to a local eldership, a local group of shepherds. 
common thing, still goes on today. People have, preachers have been yakking about it, elders have been yakking about it, members have been yakking about it for, for years and years and years, about Christians who just want to be Christians at large. I don't want to be a part of any church. I don't want to be a member of any group. Where's it say I've got to be a member? Right here, 1 Peter chapter 5. The implication is, if shepherds are to oversee a flock, you have to be in the flock. That's not a hard conclusion. It's very simple. But we need to be accountable to one another. And there's an expectation by the Lord that there will be this accountability, and accountability not only to shepherds, but even to one another. And that's the way the Scriptures teach it. That's why God established a church. That's why he has local churches. If it weren't for that, then why are, we, why are we even gathering? No, there's a work we do as a local group of people, even as there's a work we do individually. But there is a major work to be done as individuals. So there's groundwork that needs, needs to be laid there, and I think just simple applications that sometimes are not talked about and are important for us to consider. Now, let's look at Peter's exhortation here as we just have a few minutes more uh, to look at this. Look at Peter's exhortation in this. First off, you'll notice how he speaks of oversight as shepherding. So, shepherd the flock of God exercising oversight. So, here's how what shepherds do. They exercise oversight. We, we noticed what uh, Anand read for us. You, you can see both the Psalm 23 and, and Ezekiel 34, perfect pictures of what shepherding looks like. And, and that's what needs to be concentrated on. Just like we in Ezekiel 34, I'm just briefly highlighting what Anand read for us. They search the sheep and they seek them out. They rescue them from all the places where they've been scattered. They bring them out from dangerous places. They feed them with good, good pasture. Uh, just just uh, stop right there. Nothing will destroy a church any faster than bad Bible teaching and bad preaching. It's just the way it is, and you need to demand it, whether from me or anybody else. You don't put up with that stuff. And there's too much of it going on today. Uh, it just makes me sick to see what some people have to put up with. Uh, we've got a whole gorgeous, beautiful Bible here with all this wonderful stuff in it. And, and about 5% of it is ever talked about from the pulpit or even our classes. Need to do that. Uh, caught, I, other than that, I'm not I'm passionate about that at all. Cause them to lie down. We, how do you cause sheep to lie down? They're well fed. They're lack of parasites. They are without fear of being attacked or destroyed or any of those things. Yeah, sheep lie down. Yeah, it's nice. When do, what do we come to church for? So we can lie down. It's so nice. It's a refuge, isn't it? Beautiful refuge. Love that refuge God given us. I myself will be the shepherd. Jesus said, I'm going to be personally involved as a shepherd. That's what a shepherd does. They're personally involved in these things. Bind up the injured. Strengthen the weak. And maybe one of the most important, judge between sheep and sheep, rams and male goats. And not put up with those who are pushing and shoving. Causing problems within the flock. Don't allow that. Don't allow that. Because you've got to be able to lie down. That's, that's neat. So that's a study all in itself, isn't it? Uh, just beautiful thing. But this highlights then one of the major errors in appointing elders. A lot of times, as I uh, joked about a little bit in the beginning, a lot of times it's mainly, well, what are the qualifications? Well, the qualifications have to do with character. They don't have to do so much with the work that is to be done. These are the passages we need to pay more attention to. Uh, frankly, other than maybe the children issue, most of the men of this congregation could be an elder. We've got fine guys here. We've got great guys here. But there is a work that needs to be learned in the three terms that are mentioned here, being experienced, uh, being able to oversee, being able to shepherd. There's a, those are talents there that take work prior to the time you become a shepherd. Take work that all of those of you who are in your 20s, now's the time to work on this. Now's the time to do this. Take things that show us and show the church that you are shepherd-like because you are already seeking and helping and going 
toward uh, being with people who need you. And that is uh, such a beautiful picture there. Shepherd the flock also shouts to the need of every single Christian. You know, we, um, we tend to uh, drift. Like, Peter, like Hebrew writers said in Hebrews 2, we tend to drift. And it's easy to drift because we just lose our moorings. We lose where we are in life. We're just, we're just doing what's right in front of us. And pretty soon we're, we're starting to drift and we get involved and maybe in pleasures, not necessarily sinful things as we talked about this morning, but things that just catch our eye and catch our attention. And pretty soon we're swallowed up in that and all of a sudden all we're doing is church. And we're not really serving the Lord. And we're now we're vulnerable extremely vulnerable and that's where shepherds come in but it's not just shepherds it calls for the watchfulness of shepherds on those things but it also calls all christians to watch and he's talked about that in first peter we've already discussed those passages hebrews three thirteen: exhort one another daily while it is called today there's a constant thing that we have to do unless we be hardened through the deceitfulness of of sin and then Peter gives these not but commands. You'll just notice this. This is this last section there in, uh, in the verse, verses 2 and 3. And this is uh, basically the last things he does. He says here is these not but commands. Now these are not but commands different than other not but commands. Like in 1 Peter 3 when he says, uh, ladies, uh, don't pay mainly don't don't uh, do uh, just the dressing and the parading and you know, the braiding of hair and all this but uh let it be the hidden person in the heart don't primarily do this but do this these are not those kinds this is don't do that period so first off don't serve under compulsion <laughs> don't do that <laughs> serve willingly under compulsion just has to do with the idea that it's not something I love, it's not something I desire, it's not something I'm good at, it's not something I want to do. I want to care about people, I want to help people. That's the kind of person, but I've seen many shepherds who are uncomfortable with shepherding. They're uncomfortable with getting their hands dirty with things that are difficult. It's difficult, it's a hard, hard job. I watch our shepherds, I, I'm blown away by the pressures they have to go through and what they go through in order to save us and to care for us and and they, they just work at it so hard I, I appreciate them so much because of that but we don't do it that way secondly not for shameful gain so you, you can see how this works out it's not like don't do it just for money that's not what he's saying, is he? He says, don't do this for money. In the first century, it was quite common. First and second century, number, it was quite common for elders to be paid. Today, it's not so common, which ought to be more common. But it's quite common for them to be, to be paid for the work they did because there was so much work to it. But what he's saying here, you don't do it for the money. But he's warning, just as all just as preachers or whatever else, there's the idea that you might do it just because, hey, I get paid. It's a job. I've interviewed a lot of guys who want me to train them, and I could tell in the interview process, you're just looking for a job. No, you can't be a preacher. You're just looking for a job. Not the way this works. Not going to work that way. So we have, there's a great warning that he gives. Do it eagerly. I, I want to do this. I don't care what is. You know, the pay is not why. I want to do this. And then thirdly, not domineering, but being examples. One of the major, major flaws that has happened in elders across the country a lot of times in churches is get the idea they're a CEO of the church and that they can just take this authoritative way of treating members and treating the church it, it, it has been devastating I, there's a couple of older brothers who have preached for many years that are in this town that are in the surrounding areas that have sent out on facebook lengthy warnings to shepherds across the country that if you want if you want to see preachers just all quit keep doing what some of you are doing and 
he made an excellent point. I would have been too scared to say it, but <laughs> he made an excellent point. We got to be careful of that. Jesus talked about it. Matthew 20, 25, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. It shall not be so among you. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant. Whoever would be first among you must be your slave. Even the Son of Man came not to serve, but to be served and give his life as a ransom for many. And he says, this is not to be among you by anybody. This is not the way uh, that particular works. So there's a contrast between domineering and being an example. I think the easiest way to always look at that, it's similar to the relationship of a husband and wife, a father and children. So it's the same words, same words. Do wives submit? Do we submit to elders? Yes, 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 all of that, okay? How does a husband treat his wife? Okay, you got to treat the church the same way if you're treating your wife correctly. How does a, a father treat his children? He serves from the foot of the table. He serves his household from the foot of the table. That's how he does it. And he doesn't do it by demanding and domineering. And, uh, and I said it, and you better snap to it. Uh, we'll talk briefly about Nabal tonight. What was said about Nabal, uh, one of the servants of Nabal said, you know him, he's such a scoundrel, nobody can talk to him. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Just the kind of guy you want to work for, right? Nobody can talk to him. So it's a tremendous warning. We don't rule in earthly sense of ruling. That's what Jesus was saying. We just simply do not rule that way. And that is very, very dangerous. There's usually something wrong with shepherding when sheep aren't following. There's usually something wrong with shepherding. Like the guy who brought his wife into my office one day and said, would you tell her she has to obey me? If that had been so serious, I'd have fallen off my chair laughing. She's not obeying you because you're a jerk. That's the first problem. And it starts with you. Just like Jesus drew us, we draw people. That's the idea. All right, that's the conclusion. Shepherds need to reflect uh, the chief shepherd before the fiery trials come because that's a critical part of shepherding. If you're not a Christian, we urge you to think about your life and do the things that are necessary. And if there's any way we can help you in that, uh, we'd be glad to study with you, be glad to help you know what you need to do. If you know what you need to do, please, uh, you have an opportunity now to step forward and confess Christ. We pray, in Jesus, we, we pray that you will do that as we, uh, together, we stand and sing.